Hello and welcome to the seventh webcast in our conversation series brought to you by Investec Wealth and Investment. I'm Nozi Pushavalala and it is an absolute pleasure to be your host today. We are having a conversation about markets and investing in the time of COVID. Now, one thing is certain in these uncertain times is that in out of the ordinary times, Investec will always look to partner with you, our clients, to ensure that we are having ongoing dialogue and that we're bringing the best of internal knowledge and external expertise so that we may be able to surface new insights as we navigate these out of the ordinary times. Now, in the last conversation that we had, we had representation from over 41 countries. And I don't doubt that even today, we're going to have a truly, truly global conversation. So welcome to everyone and wherever it is that you are dialing in and joining us from. I'm going to get right into it by introducing um, our panelists today. It's such a pleasure that we've been joined by the governor of the South African Reserve Bank, that's Governor Lesetia Kanyako. We also know him, of course, as a renowned South African economist, a central banker, and of course, having also served the country as Director General at National Treasury. And of course, a familiar face to all of us by now is Chris Holdsworth. Uh, Chris is uh, the Chief Investment uh, Strategist at Investec Wealth and Investment. He's also the Chair of the South African Asset Allocation Committee and as well as a member of the GISG, which is, of course, the Global Investment Strategy Group. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much for making the time for this conversation. Now, Government, I come straight to you first um, and ask you, it looks like you are in a home setting, but here's the question. How are you personally uh, adjusting to this way of digital working? Well, I had found myself having to use so many uh, different platforms. So when you say we are going to have a conversation, I have to figure out which platform uh, are you using. So I became <laughs> versatile in so many uh, of, uh, uh, of these platforms. I think that uh, this is going to be a game changer. Um, yes, we are missing uh, uh, people. We are human beings and we would like to have that uh, uh, interaction. Uh, but um, big questions are going to be asked about the kinds of office space that we have always occupied and whether we needed all of those, if things can continue uh, mm. to function uh, without, uh, uh, without those. Of course, there is a drawback with this uh, 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 technology. I start many of these things early in the morning and uh, you do not realize it before you know it, it is late uh, yeah. in the evening. And you do not quite, you know, the, that break, that just moving from one floor to the other to a different boardroom, it's a game changer. Absolutely game changer, uh, Gavin. We're all trying to get with the program, if you will. I must say, I'm impressed that you even got your lighting right. So clearly somebody is doing a lot of um, assisting in making sure that your technical capabilities are on lockdown. But maybe let's just get into it because there's quite a lot that we need to unpack today. Governor, one of the things we are seeing around the world is significant stimulus uh, by governments um, globally. And I guess the question to you is, are we at the bottom of the rate cutting cycle? Um, difficult to say uh, because you can't even talk of a cycle um, uh, uh, at the moment. And what we have basically had was we had a shock that was both a, uh, a demand shock because it knocked people's uh, income so people can't uh, yeah. uh, can spend um, and then it has also been a supply shock those who could spend there are certain things that they are not able to buy and that is just domestic and you could apply the similar shock model uh, globally and so you had had to a situation where um, governments had to respond but the approach that South Africa has taken, and we were fortunate because we were amongst the late movers, had been to first recognize this as a health crisis. Right. And that this health crisis uh, led to a shock 
on the economy, both uh, mm -hmm. supply and demand uh, shock. And third, that um, that led to a tightening of financing conditions for, yeah. uh, for emerging market uh, economies. So there was also a, uh, a financial shock. And the result was that um, while the health authorities were struggling to keep us alive, both the fiscal and the monetary authorities had to respond to try and keep the economy yeah. uh, alive. Call it that the economy was on life, uh, on life support. Life support, uh, yeah. Given, uh, given that environment. So what, are, what have been the responses uh, so far? You have seen globally countries responding with uh, uh, fiscal measures. Central banks have been the first ones of the... Uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the pace because central banks had had to respond and even in our case we had had to yeah. deploy all the instruments that uh, we have at our disposals as we deem appropriate. So Gava, I want to maybe tap into the other instruments that you are referring to. What are the other tools at the Reserve Bank's disposal at this moment as we look uh, to, to intervene in, uh, in this time of uncertainty? Well, we have, um, I, I will break them into three uh, categories. Firstly, were uh, the usual monetary uh, policy response, which was to adjust the policy rate, uh, which we had done three times uh, this year. We started with a small move in January, and as it became clear that the crisis is deepening, we uh, did uh, two moves of 100 basis points each, and so the monetary policy response was a, a reduction in the policy rate of 225 uh, a basis points. But as we were going into our March MPC, we also realized that there was a dislocation in the market that price discovery seemed to have been uh, hindered. And we, uh, there was a call from people in the market that uh, we need to be uh, to be seen and we responded by availing our repo facilities um, mm -hmm. and we introduced three months six months nine months and 12 months uh, repos so that uh, the money market can continue to function but we have also seen a dislocation in the bond market and so right. we started <laughs> our bond purchase um, a program which we were very clear that this bond purchase program we were embarking on because we were seeing dysfunctionality uh, mm. in the uh, in the bond market. So those were those were uh, the ones. And then lastly, was that we responded by adjusting um, the financial regulatory um, uh, requirements. So yes. we relaxed the liquidity coverage ratio and we relaxed the uh, capital uh, buffers, released the capital buffers so that the uh, sector can dip into those capital buffers. So the totality of the response is something that you have not uh, seen mm. before uh, from the South African uh, monetary yeah. authorities. But we were able to do this because we had the buffers. So we yeah. could use monetary policy because inflation was firmly under control and below the midpoint of our uh, target range. So we could provide that. And we have got capital and liquidity buffers in the uh, in the regulatory space that we were able to um, uh, to relax mm. and uh, the fact that uh, we could see we saw that there is um, a dislocation in the market we could deploy our yeah. open market operation through a bond purchase program so i'm going to get to the bond market with you chris in a short while because i think um there's a lot of implications for the outlook based on what the Gov has just shared with us. But before I get there, Governor, let me just come back to the consideration around uh, buying corporate debt. Where is the Reserve Bank on that? Well, we have not bought uh, any uh, corporate debt. Um, we moved from the premise that the underlying market was the government bond market. And if the government bond market is dysfunctional, you have a problem because the corporate bond market is priced off the government, uh, uh, the government bond market. But yeah. also corporate bonds in South, the South African corporates have not 
really funded them that much with in, uh, uh, within the corporate uh, uh, bond market. Unlike in the US, where you have got a vibrant uh, corporate bond market, uh, here uh, corporates that are issuing bonds are really uh, limited, and many of them are actually mm -hmm. having very strong balance sheets. All right, so let's shift from the corporate and look at uh, public debt, because if we just consider the comments that were made by Deputy uh, Minister David Masondo over the weekend, speaking about how you know, uh, National Treasury would be in full support of the central bank uh, purchasing um, of government debt, in particular with the view to fund some of the efforts in response to COVID-19, and you spoke about health um, uh, responses as well as um, um, uh, ec economic responses. What is your reaction uh, to that conversation that began to surface over the weekend? Well, the dis discussion is not surfacing over uh, the weekend. Then let me say that uh, we actually do not um, uh, comment on a, a fiscal policy. I mean, it's tempting for someone like me who had spent 15 and a half years being responsible for fiscal policy. I'm sure you would uh, expect that I would have lots of views and opinions about, uh, uh, about fiscal policy. Tempting as it might be, it is something that uh, mm. we choose not to, uh, to deal with. So I will not respond to the Deputy Minister. There is a debate uh, going on amongst the central bank uh, community about yeah. the extent of the bond purchases that the central banks are doing and the extent to which uh, it could suck the central banks into making fiscal policy decisions, what are normally called quasi-fiscal uh, measures, which could be, mm. be problematic. Now, our approach to the bond purchasing has also been guided by two important uh, aspects. The first aspect has to do with the fact that the, our legislation does provide a limit of how much of a uh, government debt we can purchase uh, in the uh, in the primary um, mm. uh, uh, primary market, the, it, 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 there is a formula. There is a cap of how much uh, uh, we can do. Uh, uh, we can do that. The second limitation has to do with the fact that South Africa is a member of the Southern African Development community and in there there is a limitation that mm. um, central banks should not provide more than 10 percent of the funding to uh, mm. a, 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 to the government and it is a an international treaty that south yeah. africa uh, adheres to that said what we do with the bond purchases is a monetary policy instrument it is where the Reserve Bank has got full operational uh, independence. So um, I, I, I like putting it this way to say that when you hear government saying that the Reserve Bank should be funding us or something uh, like that, you say, that is very interesting. It's tantamount to a client saying to their banker, uh, yeah. I instruct you to fund me. Banking does not work that way. <coughs> well, it does not work. Uh, uh, that way, and the authors of our constitution were very conscious uh, of this yeah. when they segregated the responsibility between the fiscal and the monetary authority. Of course, they say that there must be regular consultation between uh, yeah. the two authorities, which the Minister of Finance and I are doing um, regularly, at least once a week, but during this COVID, we are almost like speaking every day. I mean, even yesterday, yesterday, like, I had three calls. We had three calls between uh, between yeah. us from the morning into, uh, into the evening. So, put simply, the Reserve Bank has got a bond purchase program. It is uh, um, we have embarked on this bond purchase program because we understand that a functioning bond market is important yeah. for the government, but more importantly, for us as a central bank. Our own monetary operations and our own collateral system functions through the bond market. And if we see that the bond market becomes dysfunctional, 
then yeah. we know that there is a threat that monetary policy itself might not be as effective <clears throat> as it is supposed to be. So I've got lots that you've shared there. Chris, I'd love to bring you in. I did see you smile a bit when uh, the Gov was uh, uh, speaking about the relationship between the banker and the client and, and how this is an interesting analogy that we can overlay in terms of the, co the comments uh, by the Deputy Minister over the weekend. But I'd love firstly, Chris, for you to share your overarching reactions to what you've heard uh, in terms of the comments that the Governor has made. But I'd also like you to then latch on to uh, what does this mean for the outlook of the bond market? Yeah, I think we need to start off by recognizing that the central bank has done a lot. We, we've cut rates by more than a number of other countries. Uh, we're intervening, buying bonds in the market, and we've provided some relief for the banks. But simultaneously, we need to recognize the limitations of monetary policy in this sort of environment. Um, this is an issue that's linked to the coronavirus. I mean, tourism is 2.5% or so of South African GDP. It doesn't matter what our interest rates are, we're not going to entice foreigners to come to South Africa while this problem is ongoing. Same with restaurant attendance. We may well release the lockdown, but people are not going to want to gather together until this problem is solved, irrespective of interest rates. So there's only so much that we can do. And really what monetary policy is doing up to this point is limiting the damage. So we've got an economy to get back to once yeah. we solve the health issue. So the, the primary concern is the number of cases and ensuring that number we flatten the curve and get around. Um, and when we do that, we've got an economy and jobs. Um, with that in mind, what is our view on the bond market? Um, well, first of all, the central bank buying is very helpful. It, it ensures that there isn't the sort of dislocation that we may have seen in other markets around the world and that we have seen before. Um, but for two, we don't see inflation as a threat in the short term or even in the medium term in South Africa. We know what's happened to the oil price. We know that uh, retailers are not able to push up prices at the moment, not able or not willing. We can see that from Status A. They put out weekly data on the price of essential goods. Over the whole lockdown period, it's up about 0.2% over the whole period. So inflation is not a concern. If anything, the inflation numbers are likely to be coming down. Over the medium term, do we think inflation is going to be spiking at any point? No, we don't. So we've got an environment now where the bond yields, the 10-year bond yield in South Africa is above 10% but inflation is 4% or may even end up being lower. To us, that's very attractive. So amongst the asset classes that we have to invest in, we quite like South African bonds, um, partly mm. as a result of central bank action, but partly as a result of inf our inflation outlook. So I love the fact that you've landed on fl inflation, because I want to pick up on that, uh, Governor, with you. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris's outlook is uh, inflation is under uh, control. You did mention inflation earlier, but I'd love to hear your view on the outlook for the rest of the year. Again, bringing into context the weaker rand and the lower oil prices. What is, how do you see inflation playing out? Well, uh, inflation is, uh, uh, is under control. Uh, partly because um, uh, the, as the monetary authorities, we decided much earlier, a good two years ago, to say that we are going to need some cushion within our target of three to six percent, that we would prefer to see inflation closer to the 4.5 uh, percent, right? And a lot of other things did happen that helped us to drive the inflation um, towards that 4.5%, but monetary policy action uh, was at the forefront, uh, uh, at the forefront uh, of that. We have actually our own outlook for inflation for uh, this year. We have revised our inflation outlook lower um, when we, uh, um, uh, at our previous uh, meeting, which was now yeah. in uh, April. So we, have, we see inflation for this year being 3.6 or even lower. Uh, the risks so of that inflation outlook are on the uh, on the downside so inflation is um, uh, is contained and that is exactly the buffer that i was talking about that yeah. what is what gave us mm. the room to be able to take the kind of action that we have uh, we, uh, we have taken naturally when the currency depreciates uh, the outlook for inflation changes and we expect that inflation uh, will rise and our natural response is that when uh, the currency depreciates and inflation rises as a result of the immediate depreciation of the currency, we see through that shock and wait for the second round effects. If we see that, that generally there are a lot of prices in the economy rising, rising, that's when we respond. But something else mm. came into picture this time round. The oil price collapse yeah. more than compensated 
for the depreciation uh, of the currency. And uh, as you, have, you might have seen, the Department of Minerals and Energy on Friday announced that uh, the price of uh, fuel is coming down uh, uh, today once again. So in spite of the some 25% depreciation in the currency, the decline in the oil price more than compensated mm. for that, and that had kept uh, inflation in, uh, in check. Thirdly, that um, uh, getting into um, this lockdown, the economy was uh, already weak. It was an economy that was uh, gone into recession, which is why in yeah. March we decided uh, to cut risk even before the lockdown. And when the lockdown was extended, we felt that it was necessary for us to provide further, uh, further relief. So inflation is not our worry uh, at the yeah. moment. Does it mean that we should um, forget about it? No. Uh, we need to be able to ask ourselves, what would that trajectory be over yeah. the next 18 to 24 months? But we, we have got the space to be able to mm. provide support to the economy precisely because inflation is under control. So strong alignment there, uh, the central message being uh, inflation is under control. Governor, when I asked you the question about uh, potentially buying corporate debt, you, you raised as part of your response the balance sheet uh, of corporates in South Africa. And maybe I want to flip the question uh, around the balance sheet back to you. Do you have a target uh, for the future balance sheet uh, of, of the Reserve Bank that would be driven uh, by bond purchases? bond purchases. That's the first part of the question. Um, and then I guess the second part is, if that target is reached, um, wh what does that mean for asset purchases? Would that mean that is the end of asset pur purchases? Or would there be other criteria that you would look at um, to make that decision or for the committee to make that decision? Uh, that is the danger of uh... Uh, putting targets like uh, those. I have seen many of my colleagues around the world who have said that they will buy up to this and then they approach that limit or they reach that limit and then yeah. they say, okay, what do we do? And I've seen in uh, Japan, for example, they decided to lift that limit before they even, uh, they even, got, uh, uh, they even got there. We are not in this because we are trying to manipulate the yield curve or because we do not like the prices in the bond market. We are in it because we felt that the bond market needed support so yeah. that they could continue to be adequate price discovery. Before we embarked on the asset, money, asset purchase program, what we saw was that small amounts of some 10 million rand could move the bond yields in South Africa uh, significantly in an environment where we have got a bond market which is about a turnover of over 18 trillion rand to, for it to be moved by an order of 10 million rand told us that there is a problem in the market, yeah. hence us uh, coming into, um, uh, into the market. The point here is that uh, we shouldn't be imposing limits on ourselves for as long as we see the dislocation and we feel that the correct thing to do is for the central bank to continue to purchase uh, the yep. bonds, uh, we should do so. There is, however, there are, however, two limits that uh, we have got to take account of, which have got nothing to do with the balance sheet of the uh, uh, of the central bank. The first limit is that um, bond purchases can do nothing where there is a concern about the sustainability of the debt of a country. Mm -hmm. You can go and buy the bonds the way you like, you will not be able to move the dial because there, would be, there are concerns about the uh, debt situation of the country. That's the first one. The second one is that, <clears throat> unlike the advanced economies, that have got the benefit of having their currencies as reserve currencies. We are a small open economy. So yeah. there is a limit to the bond purchases that you could make because as you make these bond purchases, you are actually creating rents that, that you are putting 
into the market. And that becomes a limit because at some stage, you will start to see people using that yeah. currency to create forex because at the moment, what people are looking for globally is dollar liquidity. And so you might end up creating dollars through your um, asset purchases uh, program. Yeah. So there is a limit of how far you can do it as, a, uh, uh, as an emerging um, uh, uh, market economy. And at some stage, these things end up catching up with you. And uh, lastly, mm. is that when you do this thing, you must also think of when the situation normalizes or should the situation reverse or there starts to be concern about your actions. Yep. What is your ability to unwind? Because mm. all of these mm. measures are done on a temporary basis. So that is the limit that we have got to have at the back of your, your mind. So the approach yep. that we have taken says that there are risks, uh, so we have got to be approaching this thing with caution. So emerging market realities and context becomes very important. What I would love to do is to transition us now to begin to explore on the back of President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa's statements uh, an invitation to start building a new South African economy. And Chris, I'm going to come to you first, and uh, I want to maybe just tap into some blue sky thinking here. If we are going to build a new South African economy, what in your view needs to be the big changes that are going to bring about that new economy? What should we be focusing on priorities from your point of view? Yeah, the first one is an old problem for South Africa, and that's uh, electricity, ESCOM. Um, it, it cannot be the case that we land up with a binding constraint like that in an environment where energy prices are so low globally, not just the oil price, but in fact, electricity itself in, in France. Mm. It, it's regularly the case that their prices are negative. So that, that's one that we have been working on. But uh, ironically, the, the current virus period may in fact accelerate our recovery there because it's allowed mm. ESCOM to increase its amount of planned maintenance that doubles what they've done before. Um, so presumably this is accelerating a path back to a normal situation, but we're still far from that at this point. The second issue for South Africa, if we did have a blue sky, we could sort out, would be education. Uh, by various objective measures, our outcomes are poor globally. But ironically as well, the current situation may in fact present some solutions to that. I mean, what this is doing is accelerating online learning. It may well be the yeah. case at some point that you could sit in South Africa and receive the best education from anywhere in the world, whether it be China or the US or um, the UK. Um, and presumably that leads to superstar lectures or lecture courses somewhere earning an absolute fortune. But more importantly, mm. people in countries around the world without facilities close by are able to get an excellent education. So perhaps we get rescued. Um, by the world, even if not through our own policies. Um, the third would be um, the ease of doing business. We rank very mm. poorly relative to the rest of the world um, by that measure. It's a World Bank study. Um, we sit at around 85 or so, if memory serves. Um, Rwanda is sitting around 40. So th there's lots of scope for improving that. And unfortunately, yeah. this current situation will not accelerate that in any way that I can see. But of the three things to focus on, those would be the three. So, uh, Governor Chris's uh, top three, uh, energy, ESCOM in particular, education, and the ease of doing business. What would your vision for building a new South African economy look like, and what would you prioritize? Would you uh, go and look at the SOEs first? Would you look to tax reform? Uh, what would be at the top of your list in terms of the big changes uh, in bringing about this new economy? Well, uh, I'm not even sure that we, can talk, we are talking of a new economy. Uh, my first point of call would be that we have got to restart this economy. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we are going to have to take cognizance of the, first, the fact that we have been under a lockdown. And so we are going to restart the economy. And as we restart the economy, this economy is not going to be the same. There are businesses that are going to disappear. Uh, yeah. that, is the, uh, that is the first one. The second one is that, as Chris talked about opportunities that are being offered, uh, the other big opportunity for me is uh, what e-commerce uh, offers uh, in yeah. this uh, environment. And I can tell you uh, now that uh, uh, the battle at home now is not who has left their 
teacup uh, way. The best yeah. thing is get off the internet because I need yeah. the broadband now. So, yes. and if we are going to take advantage of, uh, of that, we are going to have to release spectrum. We are mm. going to have to release spectrum because if we, even as we restart this economy, we are to maintain social distancing, we are yeah. going to have to take advantages of what e-commerce offers uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this environment. And thirdly, um, the things that uh, Chris said, which I would capture in one phrase, which the president uh, basically said, that this, all these temporary measures that we are putting in place are also presupposing us with a challenge of embarking on that structural reform program yeah. to make sure that we lift the potential growth rate of the economy. And it's the kind of things that Chris talked about, mm. education, health, and all of that stuff. Structural reform certainly sounds like a very uh, attractive opportunity and to put in all of the things that both you and Chris um, have spoken about. But I guess the other reality, Governor, is that th this pandemic has been quite politicized. And so I, I suspect that my, my question or pushback is, how feasible is a structural reform in South Africa given the politics of this moment and how we're politicizing the pandemic? Well, the chief executive of the country had pronounced and said that uh, this is what he is going to do. And I think uh, as South Africans, we have got to rally behind him. Mm. Now, before I get to the end of this conversation, there is another opportunity here that I think uh, is worth exploring, Governor, um, that out of this particular uh, pandemic and in learning to work differently uh, under the COVID-19 um, uh, reality, could we also be seeing an opportunity to reset the relationship between the private sector and the public sector to something that we probably have always spoken about but not quite realized? Do you see this as an opportunity? It's been reset. The relationship mm. has been reset and I think that um, you know, there is one uh, of the video clips doing the rounds in social media, uh, and, and, and it's a conversation between a father and a, and a son. And, uh, and the son, towards the end of this clip, ends up saying, but did we have to wait for a virus in order yeah. for us to work together? The point here is that the virus had achieved exactly that. It had forced us to work together. We have suddenly realized that none of us have horns, that we are all human, and that if we um, put our effort and our thinking together, we are able to work at one. I mean, I marveled when the president made the announcement and how across the political spectrum, there was a support for, uh, for the president that you know, saw that thing in the private yeah. sector. Just talking from where I am as the, as the central bank, the national treasury worked with the banking uh, industry to put a guarantee scheme of up to yeah. 200 uh, a billion rand. They asked the central bank to be uh, involved through our repo facilities to provide support to the uh, banking uh, uh, sector. A true public-private uh, a, a, a partnership, something that Nozipo, if you <laughs> asked South Africans to come with something like this last year, we, being South Africans, we would yeah. be uh, going to one summit after another summit after yeah. another summit. And what this virus actually did was to get that kind of guarantee to be gotten off the ground in a matter yeah. of weeks, something that typically would have taken South Africans months, if not years. Well, certainly hit the nail on the head there. The conversation around public-private partnerships has been going on for decades. And, um, and what I'm hearing you say, Governor, is that those that have seen the opportunity have reset the relationship. So it's, it's high time that others uh, got onto uh, the bandwagon as well. Now, Chris, I know that um, you, uh, as a member of the GISG, or the Global Investment Strategy Group, were part of the emergency meeting that was called um, just last week. Perhaps uh, just two questions for you on that. One, what is the consensus coming out of that meeting? And are there any headlines um, that in particular dovetail into this conversation that you could share with us? 
Yeah. Um, so just in terms of background, we have normal scheduled GISG meetings every quarter. Um, and when times get a little hairy, like now, we meet more frequently. Um, so at the moment, we're meeting on a monthly basis. And that's what it was on, on, on Friday last week. Uh, and we've changed our risk score. Um, it was the case that we were risk on. Um, but given how mm. markets have rallied, we've taken some off the table. And we're back to neutral. And the important point to note is not we haven't changed our view to neutral because of a change in the outlook. We still see the same U-shape economic trajectory that we did before. It's just that markets have rallied significantly post our last meeting. And the margin of safety in equity markets in particular has narrowed um, to the point that we would rather not be allocating risk at this point or rather not be allocating more risk than normal. Yeah. So we're back to neutral. In terms of the discussion point and how it feeds into this is that we are um, quite lucky within South Africa in that our risk-free asset still offers opportunity for significant return at a base case. Whereas if you were to go to say the US or Europe uh, and you decided you didn't want to invest in equities and you'd rather take some money off the table and what could you put it in? Well, your alternatives there are either negative yielding or zero yielding assets. And you'd normally buy those for insurance policies alone. And you don't get the opportunity to generate return. Whereas we in South Africa, we're not looking at equities fine. Well, we've got a bond market that's yielding 10%. Um, we've got cash rates, which are still quite, or well, not exceptionally high, but high relative to the mm. rest of the world. So we still have opportunities in SA to generate returns. And that's not the case in a number of other countries. So opportunity and South Africa coming again together in that narrative. Governor, um, as we begin to come to the end of this conversation, I perhaps want to just, um, circle back to, I think, a shared reality amongst the three of us is that we as South Africans are a resilient people. And we know that even in this conversation, as industry leaders, uh, business owners, business professionals tune into the conversation, um, they're looking to tap into that resilience because that's how we know to be as South Africans. What would your message be uh, to this community, especially around how do we win when we feel so stretched from every direction? How do we tap into that resilience? Well, um, that resilience is what has distinguished South Africa from, uh, from many other countries. We have demonstrated an amazing ability to conquer even the most adverse uh, of the conditions. And this has once again tested us uh, as a nation. And I think that looking back on how we have responded to uh, this crisis, I think that we could look back with uh, pride. There's no one who's going to tick all the boxes and says that we have done everything right. But when we look back, uh, we are going to be able to say that, yes, we have done much better than uh, many other uh, uh, countries have. But we have also been able to rally our people uh, around uh, this cause. I mean, the, 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 the number of initiatives that South Africans yeah. have taken of giving, of caring, uh, it's just truly, truly amazing. It's just demonstrate what uh, this country uh, itself yeah. uh, uh, is, made, uh, uh, is made of. We are having an economy that now has been uh, significantly uh, battered we are going to have to uh, restart this economy. We are going to have to rebuild uh, uh, this economy. From where I am sitting as a central bank, I can say to South Africans that the Reserve Bank will deploy uh, all its tools and instruments as it is appropriate in accordance with our mandate to ensure that the economy is actually uh, adequately uh, adequately. Uh, 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 supported. And we do these things as our contribution and we, mm. will, I'm sure, other state players in the South African economy uh, will also be uh, playing uh, their, uh, their role. And I think that with that, we can really tap into the resilience of the South Africans yeah. in conquering this crisis. It's all hands on deck and you remind me of our hashtag, our national hashtag during the Rugby World Cup, Governor, Better Together. And I think that's what we know as South Africans. Chris, there are investors uh, that are tuning into this conversation. If you were just to extrapolate some of the important highlights out of this uh, conversation that the investment community is tuning into, what would those highlights be? Um, 
the, the first is that inflation in SA is, is not a problem for the next 12 months at least. It may be a problem later on, we worry about that then, but certainly over the short term, it, it's not an issue. Uh, and that allows the central bank some space to move. And that's true globally as well. If you look at inflation surprise indices around the world, um, they're below zero. That is inflation surprising on the downside pretty much everywhere in the world at this point. Um, and as a result, we can expect as much intervention as is possible from central bank authorities and from fiscal authorities. But uh, as I said, earlier, that, that's not sufficient. We need to bend the curve. And it's only once on the other side that we can really start to try to estimate what growth is. Up until yeah. this point, it's really trying to estimate what companies are resilient and will survive um, yeah. in the best shape and to be able to catch that wave of growth. Um, so it, it, it's still not quite the case that we're um, jumping with risk on into South African equities. We're certainly not. Uh, we think the opportunity is in South African bonds instead, um, aided by the central bank's actions. Aided by the central bank's actions. Uh, Governor, you have shared with us your message of resilience. Um, from the perspective of being the governor of the central bank, I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to ask that as Lesetia Kanyaho, what is the hope and optimism that's keeping you going and could you share that with us? Well, the optimism really for me is in the resilience of uh, South Africans. Um, I have not seen South Africans rugged for a cause like uh, we have seen uh, them now. And if we can do it because we faced the challenge of a virus, we surely can rally South Africans to building a better future. Well, if we can do it to take on a virus, we certainly can do it to build a better future. What an awesome conversation. A very big thank you to the Governor of the Reserve Bank. A very big thank you to you, Chris Holsworth, for joining us once again. A big thank you to all of you that are tuning in and dialing in from all over the world to be part of this truly global conversation in Out of the Ordinary Times. I hope you're taking away insight and clarity out of this conversation. From myself, Nozipo Shabalala, it's been an absolute pleasure being your host once again. Goodbye.